Thank you. After the lunch session. <laughs> That's the energy that we need. Um, we're going to be using Nearpod today. How many of you are familiar with Nearpod? Okay, handful. Um, we are, would like to introduce you to Nearpod, for those of you that aren't familiar. Uh, it is a way for us to share our slides with you and interact with you throughout the session. We are going to be doing some activities. Um, and it's a way for you to provide some uh, information among groups and with each other. So if you go to nearpod.com, N-E-A-R-P-O-D.com, you're just going to enter this code. It also, uh, this is, you have to go to the for students link. Yes, today, now, just for the next 60 minutes, your students. Um, you're going to enter that code, and it does ask for a name, but... You know, you can enter anything you like, have a little fun, um, or just enter nothing, which would be fine as well. And if anybody's having any problems logging in, raise your hands, so we can help you out. What's your forum? Sure, nearpod.com, N-E-A-R-P-O-D, nearpod, Excuse and Peter. How many of you are in? Cool, so if you're not, um, having a hard time, please just talk to your neighbor and I'm sure you'll be able to figure out. Um, but we're also here to help you if you're still not able to get in. And I'm also going to call out Jesse Bowman over there. Raise your hand, Jesse. <laughs> That's our local, uh, our, our site here, but uh, expert. Um, he'll be able to help us as well. Uh, you should now have our slide on your screen. And as I advance, it should advance on your uh, machine or device. All right, we're oriented. Welcome. Um, we are going to be talking about an event that we held at Northwestern Christopher School of Law this past uh, year um, to talk a little and to share with you about our experience and then to run some exercises and activities as we explore how do you spark innovation among your faculty. Um, like to introduce ourselves, and I'm going to have Claire introduce herself first, and I'll sit down now. Yeah, sure thing. So I am Claire Willis. I'm a research and instructional services librarian at Northwestern. Awesome. And my name is Allison Carroll, and I'm our assistant dean of law and technology initiatives, and I also teach through our center on negotiation and mediation. Uh, we are also going to be using a, a question and uh, format through Google Slides. So if at any point throughout our session, um, if you have a question you would like to ask, uh, you can enter it by going to, does it say it up there? No, it does not. Well, that's frustrating. I think you'd have to go to the Google Slides thing. On mine, it has a, it has yeah. a oh, does it? click, yeah. and then it takes you yeah. right yeah. to yeah. it. Yeah. Beautiful. Should we do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did you write the thinking code on the board? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you just read that to me right there? <clears throat> G-H-J-R-D. G-H-J-R-D. It's also um, always up in the top left-hand corner to link into the Nearpod. And now that we're on this slide to answer any questions, you can click on that, and it will um, provide you a second window. Keep that open. Anytime you have a question, you can put it in there. You can vote up questions um, so that the ones that end up at the top, uh, we will spend some time at the end of the presentation to go through those questions with you. And if we end up running out of time, we'll make sure that during the break uh, we talk with you as well. Absolutely, yeah, and I'll be monitoring those questions. I will not be answering, is there a God? Sorry about that. <laughs> You're going to have to work that out yourself. My favorite color is blue. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is uh, a little information about Teach Law. I'm going to take us to this website. So Teach Law was an event that we held at Northwestern in August 2017. The idea of trying to spark innovation in the classroom um, at the law school. And um, it was a day-long fair where faculty presented um, in a variety of different formats, from panels to uh, five-minute demos in various groups um, across the law school. 
to share how they're using technology in the classroom to address some pedagogical challenge that they were facing. Um, these are just some pictures from it. Uh, we chose the name Teach Law because tech is in the word teach, if you believe it. Um, and so we were just trying to encourage our folks that this is okay, if this is familiar, it's actually in the word we do, which is teaching. Um, and uh, so we used the word teach law, and then this event ended up uh, growing throughout the year to be an ongoing series of lunchtime demonstrations, as well as a website resource that we've provided for our faculty, it's also open to the public, where we continue to identify new instructional technology tools um, for teaching in the classroom, but we've also tried to address concerns from our clinicians and how they can use technology in their practice, <coughs> as well as uh, tools for our research faculty and their scholarship. Oh, I have to go back on to. <coughs> so if you can tell, we were uh, in Nearpod, and I had a link, I'm just going a little meta here for you guys, um, and then took you guys external to uh, this website about the Teach Law event. You should have been able to click on and now have that. If you were in a classroom where that website was something you really wanted your students to bookmark and always have, you've now just shared it with them without having to do anything. You're welcome to bookmark this. I don't know if you really need to. <laughs> we'll go back to the Nearpod lesson. And Nearpod was one of the technologies that we demoed at Teach Law. So as Allison mentioned, uh, Teach Law turned into just kind of a whole year continuing initiative. Uh, we had the, the website resource that you see a little snippet of down there on the left. And this was designed to house some of the things that came out of um, of the Teach Law Day itself, but to also be something continuing where we could continue to put out educational technology resources. So there is an area for clinicians that goes to the clinical resources area. There's another one that's a guide to teaching that has articles about active learning, a glossary of educational technology terms, and so on. And then there's also our scholarship area there that includes links to information about things like PERMA CC. And those, those first two that I mentioned, the <coughs> clinic guide and the teaching guide, are run off of LibGuides. Uh, librarians should be familiar with LibGuides. Uh, the idea is that it's very, very easy and user-friendly to edit versus having to edit an entire website. So and there's also, and this is the way I have the clip for it there on the right. Great job, Claire. You wore the same jacket. <laughs> <laughs> I have it's stellar. I by have the way. such a varied wardrobe of <laughs> northwestern colored things. Um, so, so it was also a demo series, and this demo series has been really great because uh, Teach Law, as we'll talk about later, was meant to be pitched very broadly. It was meant to give exposure to a lot of different technologies and a lot of different ideas. The demo series lets us hone in on some specific technology. So we had a whole hour on nothing but. WebEx and how it could be used. We had a whole hour on active learning, which is what that's uh, a clip from there. And that also allows us to get at different populations for these as well. The WebEx demo was very well attended by faculty assistants, and that um, was something we hadn't necessarily thought of, but faculty assistants are hugely important for engaging faculty and getting them to um, to meaningfully and uh, painlessly adopt different technologies. Um, and these also could be little um, meta presentations as well, because the active learning talk that we gave was actually given in an active learning space, uh, which in turn allowed us to highlight that space as well. Um, so in terms of results of Teach Law, well, it's a whole new school, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but uh, so the, one, one great result has been that there is more interest in those active learning spaces. Um, I'm sure I'm you know, preaching in the choir when I say that active learning spaces are difficult to get built in terms of how expensive they are, and it can be very difficult to get people to use it because it's, it's different from the traditional classroom. But then by being able to highlight them and show them um, we got more interest in those spaces. 
we also, our, our curriculum committee is currently going through um, an activity of cataloging our courses in a new way. And one of the things they asked me to look at was which courses touch technology in some way, um, typically in an applied way. And so the fact that they were even aware <laughs> was, a, was a positive. And we've had some good uh, student feedback from some of the things that professors are doing, especially around the active learning space. Um, and, and we have to acknowledge that in planning Teach Law and putting it on, the student perspective wasn't really one that was overtly considered. Um, just because of some kind of cultural factors that we'll talk about a little bit later. But I think we can all agree that when faculty use and understand edu educational technology better, the students do benefit. Another result was adoption of some of these instructional technologies. And so Jesse Bowman, um, who I had pointed out earlier, demoed Nearpod during Teach Law, and enough faculty um, expressed interest in it that we decided to get an institutional license. Um, Nearpot is free, so you can use it at any point. It does limit, Jesse, the number of individuals that can be interactive. I think it's 30. To 30 yeah, if you don't have an institutional license. But something like Poll Everywhere. You can use Poll Everywhere for free, but up to 40 responses at a time. Same thing with Nearpod. But because of the interest, we ended up adopting um, an institutional license, getting an institutional license um, for Nearpod. Uh, we also noticed that our IT department became far more integrated in some of our learning approaches, the curriculum committee, and our students. So our IT uh, is a fantastic group of individuals, but up until this past year, they were housed in the basement of the law school. <laughs> Awful. This year, they moved into a space at the, at, the, at the front of our library. They're one of the first people that you see besides our librarians um, once you walk in. And their involvement with Teach Law started creating some connections with faculty. So there was much more integration among our IT and our faculty. Are there any other results that you want to go over right now? Nope. Okay. There might be some questions that come up, um, but we'll go ahead and move forward. What we wanted to do is try to break down why we felt this Teach Law event was successful and um, spark some cultural change within the law school, and then ask you to go through an exercise to see um, what might work for your school. So what works at our school may not work for your school. What works for our faculty might not work for your faculty, but I, we thought that some of um, the basics might translate and then we'll allow you to tailor that to your um, institution. So when the idea of this event first came up, um, I uh, had just been appointed as our Assistant Dean of Law and Technology and the question was, okay, well what's our goal in wanting to do this? There are a couple faculty member, uh, members who said that it would be really fun to see some technology. And it's like, yeah, but how are we going to get people to come? How are, how are we going to put this on in a way that it actually is worth our while? And so the first thing I did was try and, <coughs> I'm going to say lower the bar, <laughs> focus our goal on something I thought was achievable. And so the goal that we set was just to spark some interest, um, just to spark some interest in the faculty so that they understood, oh, look, there are these cool new tools that are out there. Oh, if I reflect on my teaching, there might be some challenges I'm experiencing that instructional technology um, or other tools might help me with. Um, so that was our goal in putting on this event. Um, we could imagine that your goal is uh, to do things like adopting a very specific technology. For instance, uh, we adopted Canvas how many years ago now? I don't know. Yeah, okay, well, yeah. Um, but when we first adopted it, there was so many emails going out. You need to use this. This is where we're going. And trying to get the faculty to become more comfortable and, and just willing to adopt this specific technology. So one goal could be that, to adopt a specific technology. Um, another could be to increase some of the built-in technology that uh, the school has put in. So um, we are in a lovely room here at American. Um, and I think Callie has provided this surface. But you know, each school sort of has a slightly different setup. 
does, are you trying to encourage the faculty to adopt that? So your goal might be different than ours, which was just to spark interest, um, but uh, you want to think about what that goal might be. So we'd like to ask you, if you were to consider starting a faculty-wide initiative uh, related to innovation in the classroom, what might be your goal? Uh, you don't have to do this alone. We'd like to encourage you to talk to the people around you. We do have handouts. You can also handwrite or you can input um, some of your ideas up here. I'll just survive. Um, and so we'd like to just give you a couple minutes to talk with those around you to um, share some of your ideas about what a good goal might be to spark uh, interest faculty-wide. We'll come back together in a couple minutes. more general um, to, uh, yeah, I think I survive, um, <laughs> student engagement, modernizing uh, teaching, how we teach law. Um, so a wide variety, which is what we expected. So as we continue through the presentation, we're going to be pointing to a couple other key elements that we thought led to the success of teach law, and you can continue to tailor this uh, to your institution. Just to go meta again for a moment, uh, here we are in the Nearpod space. You were able to provide an information notice that other students can comment simply by liking, because we're in Facebook, um, liking those comments. It gives you a sense of, okay, around the room, increased awareness of available resources and services seems to be something that a lot of folks uh, agree with. And uh, faculty participation, just the use of technology is something that um, might be uh, uh, familiar or of interest to more individuals. So that immediately gives me as an instructor focus on where I might go next by using Nearpod. The other thing that Nearpod allows you to do is up here in the top right, it's got a share button. I can press this and send this board as an email to the class. Uh, if we're doing an activity and they want to capture this, I can now share it immediately. If I'm working with a collaborator and we're going to that next step, I can immediately share it and it stays. If I'm doing this presentation multiple times, uh, the next time I go to this presentation, uh, it's also it, this information would be gone. So it's, it's new every time you do it, so it's very useful in that way when you're repeating presentations, but you can also save that information simply by sharing it. Okay, back to <laughs> Teach Law. Um, so we've talked about what is your goal. Ours was just to spark interest. Yeah, so then the, the next piece, the next element to making this successful was to consider motivation. What actually motivates the faculty? Um, and this is extremely unique to every different institution. Um, uh, Allison and I gave a version of this talk a couple weeks ago, and someone was saying, well, we give out awards for best use of technology in the classroom. And for some cultures, awards really would be motivating. Other places, if you put out free food, it's great. Um, <laughs> other places, free drinks. Um, so it's just a matter of considering what is motivating. And for us, we figured out that what was motivating 
was to drum up excitement, to just kind of get people excited about the idea of technology, but also to see what other peers at the institution were doing. So that was kind of the motivating factor. We thought that, um, that people, the, we knew that people were doing interesting things and we knew that faculty are generally curious about what the person in the next office is doing. Um, so being able to expose the interesting things that people are doing um, we thought would be very motivating to get people to see what is out there. And I just, just to um, add to that, we talked about bringing in external individuals who are actual experts in these instructional technologies but we didn't think that would be motivating to this particular faculty. Um, we also didn't think it would be motivating for them to try things um, uh, where students could see them um, or where we were putting them on the spot. So we really wanted to make sure it was a safe space for them. Exactly. Yeah. So, there we go. <coughs> So what motivates your faculty to get engaged? Um, is, it, is it food? Is it drink? Is it, um, is it a, a reputational thing? You know, being <laughs> food, students, yep, food. Um, money, yeah. Community, wow. Tenure, Tenure credit. credit, there's, there's money at peer pressure, yeah. And I, I guess viewed one way, our... Um, <laughs> Other sprite. <laughs> I think they meant to type sprite. That was it. No, no, no. Is that all right? <laughs> Following the people they it's respect. Um, can you track progress? Yeah. What is that? Oh, oh me. Sometimes recognition can be a huge piece. <laughs> so I think that a lot of these are similar, certainly. Um, and I should say that we did feed everyone at our event. Um, but for some of it, it's, it's being recognized. And I think for, for other cultures, they don't necessarily want to be recognized for these things. They want to share them more one-on-one -on -one with just a small group of people. And some of our presentations were actually like that. It would just be, it wasn't necessarily a presentation in a room like this, I should say that. It was more like um, just being in a seminar room and talking with maybe six to eight people about what you did in the class. Room. So it was much quieter. Um, yeah, exactly. This this is really the model for what the event was like. Um, was just sort of a, a personal discussion, and and we found that to be very motivating for people to share. So. The other piece that has to be there is that you have to involve key stakeholders. And when it comes to something like educational technology, it's easy to roll your eyes and say, oh my gosh, literally everybody is a stakeholder in this. Um, but I think that for something, for an initiative like this to be successful, you have to consider who is key. Who really has to be on board in order for this to be successful. And this will be unique to different institutions as well. Um, for us, the key stakeholders were to have people from multiple different groups within the law school be on board. Yes, obviously the dean had to be on board, and he 100% was on board. He loved this idea. Um, but it was also important to have individual professors, individual librarians on board for several different reasons. Um, one of them is that it made the presentations better, and we'll go over that a little bit more later. Um, but the other reason is because uh, people really took on a lot of ownership of the event. Um, Allison approached a lot of people about presenting and then when these uh, key stakeholders felt like this was their presentation, this was their event, they were making it for their colleagues, they really took on a lot of ownership and wound up promoting the event for us. So that's a good thing as well. So let's see here. Who would be your key stakeholders? 
who would have to buy in for it to be a success? You can't, you can't get everybody. The dean, yeah, absolutely, dean, <laughs> dean, senior faculty. Tenured, younger faculty, the students. Mom. Mom, yeah. The naysayer, good point. <laughs> Big money alumni, yeah. Ooh, how do we get back to the Google Doc for questions? Go okay. We will bring back up the Google Doc for questions. <laughs> Whoever is holding the stake, good point. That is the stakeholder. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad that Grace Lee mentioned this, this, fickle, this faculty who are big consumers and users of technology. Those were two um, opposing stakeholder groups that we really did want to engage and get involved were those who were the big time technology users, but also those who were not. Because I think that when someone sees, oh my gosh, so-and-so came to the technology event, knowing that so-and-so does not use any technology, I think it really says a lot about, about the event and about the use of technology. Let me go back to the Google Doc real quick. There we go. Uh, on your screen should now again be that Google Q&A. If you want to uh, click on that and take it to another window and keep that open, it should allow you to ask questions throughout. So with all that in mind, your key stakeholders, so how do you actually make the match between your goal, the motivation, and who those key stakeholders are? So for us, the idea was to engage peer advocates, as opposed to, like Allison said, bringing in an external expert. Um, and there are a couple pieces here is that um, faculty are curious to know what their colleagues are doing, and there are interesting things to be seen. The faculty are doing interesting things with educational technology. And uniquely when it comes to teaching, teaching is oftentimes described as being a very solitary activity. And it is. Outside of somebody sitting in in one of our classes, we usually do it for the students and nobody really sees it. So unless we find some way to peel it back to be able to show what professors are doing, um, it can remain <coughs> hidden. Um, and also we know that faculty like to learn from their peers. But in this case, we had to think about peers in a couple of different ways. We had to think about having presentations from people who are institutional peers. So we would have um, law librarians, but also tenure track faculty, but also clinical faculty, but also legal writing faculty, so that everyone could kind of see themselves represented in the initiative. Um, but we also wanted to think about peers in the technological sense, as I said before, um, because I, I don't think you can say that if you bring along the younger faculty, you're necessarily getting the most tech savvy group. I think that's, uh, that's incorrect. So you have to include all of those different groups. Um, so these peer advocates, these were the people who actually gave the presentations and went to each other's presentations as well. So then we had to actually uh, make it interesting. <laughs> so we tried to demonstrate just a variety of platforms across a spectrum. So we had really flashy things like the light board that was um, in one of these pictures. Uh, that was created by a faculty member in another area of the university. I just have to show the flashiness. Literally lights up. Um, to things related to our Canvas LMS, so apps that were um, embedded as part of Canvas uh, from Yellow Dig and Panopto to apps that are or um, uh, capabilities of Canvas that are just unique to Canvas and other LMS like quizzes and the data analytics. So again, trying to meet our faculty wherever they were at. Some of our faculty wanted um, something very new and to think about things um, in big picture. Others were just like, this Canvas thing is driving me nuts. And I don't really understand why we had to make the switch. I liked what I was doing before, even though it's been 
a number of years since we made that switch, still telling us we should be to make a change. Um, so we wanted to show this is how your peers are using this and why they're finding it of value. And so uh, the data analytics, uh, Claire worked with a faculty member, another faculty member, and talked about the use of data and the use of quizzes and how it could be used in a doctrinal class. Uh, Jesse talked about a legal technology class, we also tried to demonstrate the variety of platforms in a variety of settings. We don't have a learning engineer on, I was just in the session before lunch about online learning. How many of you else were here just right before? Yeah. There's a lot of talk about learning engineers and instructional designers. And if you've got a learning engineer or instructional designer at your law school, like power to you, you better be in touch with them. And if you are one of them, you are the most valuable individual at the law school. We should all be touching and talking to you more. <laughs> My kid's here and she's got her headphones in, so all is good. <laughs> uh, but the, we don't have a learning engineer that's on staff for our law school. But we do have learning engineers that were a part of the university. So we also had them on site with the idea being that as we demonstrated these variety of platforms, we did so so that they could understand how it might work for them. Um, we also talked about not only instructional technology that they could use to enhance the interaction with the students, um, but we also talked about how they could share information more interactively, like Nearpod, but as well as other technology about how they're connecting their devices to the classrooms. So, in some ways, it is actual hardware. How do you do this so that you can use your own device? Um, we had just installed something called Solstice that allowed faculty to bring their own device. And I didn't worry about the wires. Just turn on a button and all of a sudden, go to a website. Um, and their information would then be projected into the classroom. So a variety of platforms in a variety of different contexts. So then we also had to create engaging presentations. And this is really, I think, where it came together and where the peer advocate piece was hugely important. Um, so these presentations were, as I showed before, just kind of small group discussions. And I think that my experience that's in that picture there is emblematic of how it went. I was sitting at a table um, with a doctrinal faculty member who was talking about how he used quizzes in his contracts class and um, we had some people from legal writing on myself a librarian some other doctrinal faculty who were all there able to ask and answer questions about teaching about this technology um, and this was just something that was embedded in canvas about a, talking about an active learning activity in an active learning classroom um, with actually some people from the, the teaching and learning group from the main campus mere steps away to answer questions. It was just a matter of creating that kind of environment that from there anything could happen. People could make connections. People could say, oh, isn't that actually what so-and-so does? And then they could follow up with that person later. And that was really what made the presentations engaging, was not necessarily that we pulled out all the stops. It was just a matter of manufacturing an environment where people could share information that they don't necessarily like talking about, teaching, and also the use of technology. Although it depends. But also, unfortunately, true. Sure. Yes. <laughs> um, so this is how we, uh, how we thought of looking at our goal, which was to expose our faculty and just to spark some interest in this. Um, the motivation that we thought that would get them engaged would be to have, be from peers, information and the examples be from their peers, those individuals whom they trust the most. Um, and we tried to involve uh, a diverse number of stakeholders to try to build an interest and buzz around the law school so that when we had this fair with engaging presentations and a variety of platforms and various peer advocates from low to high tech, from clinical research, CL, uh, uh, legal research and writing, 
um, that we were touching that we were see this is why I'm saying touching <laughs> we were getting to everybody what the heck getting to everybody um, so that's how we matched those three elements of goals motivation and key stakeholders you all have already been brainstorming how um, you would approach this from your institution's point of view what would motivate your faculty what you would want your goal to be and so we'd like you to spend some time in groups thinking about okay what could you put together that would spark uh, faculty-wide inspiration and so there should be some handouts that uh, were passed out we may have run a little short so you might have to share um, but work <coughs> with a couple people around you this can be groups of three or four individuals not going to prescribe um, <laughs> you guys can find a group to talk about based on your elements to consider what you might bring to the table and then we'll do a report out in about five minutes does anybody need another handout? Would like another handout?
guys to do that like function and we'll pick a couple to uh, report out and talk a little bit about why you think that would work, how it would work, and what your next step is to make it happen. Thank you. So um, we saw some really, really cool ones on here. It looks like a couple that have a lot of votes. Um, Emily, do you mind talking about uh, getting on the schedule with existing faculty programs and workshops? So um, Debbie can talk about this too, uh, but uh, Debbie and I used to do probably monthly faculty workshops just on tech. And we found the faculty weren't in the office very often and there was less attendance. There were more faculty who kind of knew things. They valued our expertise, but they just weren't around. So scheduling things became a huge challenge. But at Chicago Ken, our faculty also um, already have an existing workshop calendar, and it's usually them bringing in some research in progress and discussing it. But we just asked to be on there once a semester. And the last one we did, um, we labeled it very carefully. So it's actually a combination of several things I put in here. But um, instead of making it about technology at all, we s said repurpose your presentations for quick and easy video lessons. And then I talked a little bit about, basically I just stole Ben Chapman's talk from last year. Um, <laughs> I gave him credit. <laughs> he was fine with it. Um, but I talked about some of like the um, multimedia learning theory and saying like, okay, you guys already have presentations, but you might want to break it down into individual pieces because I was a um, distance ed student. I can tell you that watching a video where somebody just has a giant block of text on the screen doesn't work. So we talked a lot more about like, okay, you've got existing information. It's not hard to create new slides. And it started with things like that that were really easy for them to say, yeah, I could take an existing presentation and break it down 
And then we added an extra step of maybe you want to add an illustration instead of just text. And then we showed, um, and Debbie did some video demonstrations to show that they could then record the whole thing using some software we had that was really user friendly. So at that point, they were like, yeah, I could do that. I could do that. I guess I could learn that. <laughs> Um, so and it, it sounds like step. you definitely slotted it in with what worked within your own institution's culture. Exactly. The idea was that you show up for these workshops that are at a certain time, and so right. that and they provided the free food. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so food is a motivator. Showing up for these different uh, sessions works, even though it was the same information that you were probably already providing in those workshops, just kind of retooled in that different way. Um, so, who, how did you get on the calendar? What was the key stakeholder that you had to to reach for that? Debbie did it. I did it. I spoke to the people who are, you know, you, you, so in Chicago, Ken yes. and Kate, whoever's in charge for the, the that semester, that year's faculty um, workshops, and I say, I would like to get onto the calendar. Here's my big idea. They say, that sounds great. They find a time for us. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes we, the two of us, sometimes I'll bring in faculty guests. And because it's in a time that they're already planning to be in a session anyway, that helps increase attendance. Also, free food. Mm -hmm. so. There you go. Yeah, exactly. So let's see here. I think um, we could continue to talk about this, but I want to be sure that we get to questions. And um, I wrote up on the board the same Google Slides URL that hopefully Do you want me just go to it? Works. Yeah. <coughs> yes, please. So this is, uh, someone asked whether or not this is the free or paid Nearpod subscription. This is a paid Nearpod subscription. And uh, the important difference here is that uh, the free subscription limits the number of people that you can have responding. Um, so something like this wouldn't be possible with the free version. Uh, near, you just go to nearpod.com and you create a free account with your email address. and. Somebody also in the audience was asking me, related to that, um, how do I create the slides once, once I'm in there? It has embedded its own slide creator, but you can also upload um, anything from your Google Drive, so Google Slides, you can upload PowerPoint, and so you can keep the faculty member in whatever platform they might be most familiar, and then just upload it. When it comes to the interactive slides, uh, that is uh, unique to the Nearpod platform, and so you just um, say you're going to add a slide, and it'll ask you, do you want to do it as a slide, as a website, or as an activity? You choose activity. And there are uh, a few, I think three or four different options to choose as activities. One is the collaboration board. Another is polling. So this can also take the place of your clickers, your poll everywhere. So what is the cost? I mean, can you tell us what the cost was when for your license? I am blissfully ignorant of that. <laughs> I had to demonstrate uh, how many faculty would participate. And I, um, at that time, right after we did teach law, I had around 10. And that was it. Um, and they said it was worth it uh, with the 10. Does each faculty get their own account? At, within the university, with our email address, any faculty member now can have an account um, with the, under this institutional license. I don't know if it was limited. Jesse, do you remember any of this as we talked through it? No, and I, and I was thinking of the pricing. I, I remember for the institutional license, it just had the credit contact us. <laughs> you probably can negotiate it because yeah. they, they do have prices on there of like $300 per teacher or something I saw. But I, institutionally, I bet you can negotiate. <coughs> yes? You had mentioned that the activity you clear the next time you do it. Is there a way to keep that board there for people to look at it later or something like that? Uh, so Nearpod allows you to do a couple things with the presentation. So I, we gave you a code to log in. I can, when I close it, I can save it as that code. And then that information will still be there. I can also close it, edit it, and start with a new code. I can also save it as a student paste presentation, which means I can embed this entire presentation into my Canvas module, and students can go through it at their own pace um, as an online activity. 
So I have another question. So you were saying there, that the free, there's like 30, <coughs> is that 30 present, pres, presentators or, or, act, or people in the class or? Participating in those collaborative components to the activity okay. and logging in to see it on their device. Okay. So in a room like this, if I had the free account, the first 30 people to sign um, and put that code in would have access to it. And then it would say, sorry. Just like with poll everywhere where it says this is uh, closed. Mm -hmm. Somebody tries to log into it. So somebody asked about measuring the effectiveness of the Teach Law program, any stats or anecdotal. I don't think we have any statistics. Um, anecdotally, I can say that I had some students who were in my ALR class who liked to use my ALR classroom kind of as their personal clubhouse. Um, and they got kicked out of their clubhouse a lot. Um, that the active learning place, yeah, I was kind of bummed for them, but, um, but it is actually getting used more. And there's another active learning space in the library um, that's similar, and it's also getting a lot of use. Uh, I would add to it again, anecdotally, um, the adoption rate of something like Nearpod, uh, now that the academic year is over and some faculty are already planning their fall semester, ooh, you're good, um, <laughs> I'm getting emails about are we keeping Nearpod, are we going to be using Poll Everywhere, what's happening, and these were faculty who had not previously been using instructional technology. So it is an uptick. And, and people continue to attend the, um, the demonstration series uh, from many different populations within the law school. It wasn't just a one-day thing. Everyone kind of saying, well, that was fun. Let's never do that again. Um, <laughs> that they uh, continue to attend them and to show interest in it. Yes. So I love this school, but it doesn't have to take place of Poll Everywhere. Poll Everywhere provides. Um, so you're not saying when a faculty says, are we getting rid of poll everywhere, it's not because this is replacing. Uh, we don't have an institutional license for poll everywhere. And um, so she was curious what was happening this fall. Were we keeping this? Or there has been talk over the last many years about whether or not we were going to get an institutional license for poll everywhere. And the answer has been no up until this point. Yeah. So it, I guess my point was it can act as a polling software so that you don't have to have poll everywhere. And also it can get, you know, a, this an event like this can get a very traditional faculty having those kind of conversations, like poll everywhere versus Nearpod. That's a pretty great conversation to hear that people are having. <laughs> it's a shocker. Uh, There's a question is over Nearpod, here. Is it uh, FERPA compliant? I'm sorry, say it again. FERPA compliant? Oh, that's a great question. Um, hmm. Jesse, <laughs> do well, you know the answer to that? Yeah. But I mean, presumably, if, if they don't put their real names in. Sure. There, yeah, there are certainly makes... ways you can control some of that, um, but I don't know about its own back end. I think a lot of these, these capturing uh, features that we're talking about here, you wouldn't have to use them. It could just be an in-class. But you're not concerned using this application in, within your institution? That somebody would, like, screenshot it or something? Well, I mean, to be in compliance, I guess. Yeah, um, that is not an issue that has come up. A question from the faculty. That I think Debbie's got some thoughts in the back. Debbie, um, um, it's, you know, take a, take this for what it will, but it claims um, compliance with GDPR and uh, FERPA and COPPA and other things. I mean, you know, it, so if you need to bring that, like, do they say they are? Yes. You're going to do your own assessments on how your institution implements FERPA and it doesn't. Um, so, you know, I don't, see, I don't see an issue that would be like for, you know, casual use. If you were like doing, storing grades in here, that would be something different. Mm. That's awesome. Thanks, Debbie. Do you mind if we get a question here before we go online? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Great. I was going to ask, like, um, this is basically a, a screen sharing uh, website. So if you want to do a PowerPoint presentation, it works in conjunction with that, correct? 
you can, uh, a couple of different ways. So you can upload your PowerPoint to Nearpod so that it is now putting your PowerPoint slides on the student's devices so they can see it and interact with it in that way. Um, but also, of course, I can have my PowerPoint up and then go to Nearpod for something else. But it's less seamless for the students. Okay, so like in the, the case that the professor uploads uh, their PowerPoint presentation in Nearpod, um, they would have to share it in order for a student to have access to it if they want to download. Correct. Okay. Yeah, this, so somebody asked on the Google Slide Q&A, um, do you have a URL for the slideshow? So I, we've not given you a URL, and yet we've been able to share the slides with you during this presentation. Um, but if I wanted to give you access to download it, I would have to give you a different uh, piece of information. All right. We've got one. Yeah. Okay. Oh, one more. <laughs> Let's go. Back.